The mountain to the left, Mount Everest. You probably heard that this place is really crowded, like 25, 50 people at the same time on the summit. Not this day. This day on 11th of May 1990, there were four people that summited. And three of them had already been on the summit on the way down. One of them was my friend, Michael. He became the first Swede on the summit of Everest. There was an American and an Australian. So I was a bit slow. I was five hours after them. And I think I was probably feeling the most lonely person on this planet, being all alone on the summit of Mount Everest. Um, of course, happy, crying, laughing, but you know, I knew that you know, this is just halfway. And you probably heard about climbing up mountains, it's, you know, ascending mountains, it's, it's tough. I think it's a lot tougher coming back down again. You know, I tried to call my girlfriend you know, on the VHF, on the satellite phone back in Sweden, and try to talk to her and say, oh, I'm on the summit, but she was with the car at the mechanic, so she didn't answer the phone. <laughs> um, so I started climbing down instead. Um, four years later, we did a, a go on the mountain to the right, which is the fourth highest mountain. Uh, it's called Lotse. It's 8,516 meters. And it's pretty tricky, a lot more technical climb than Mount Everest, because there's a couloir leading up 500 meters, pretty steep, from the last camp to the summit. And it's a mixture of ice, rock, and, and um, snow. So we, we summited way too late in the evening, uh, took some pictures. We know, knew that this was way too late, but we knew that there's no way we can get lost because there's only this couloir leading straight down to our tent. So we took the pictures and, and uh, you know, uh, having a good time um, up there, you know, as good as you can have, it was pretty foggy. And this picture is taken uh, by another climber from Everest actually. But you can see the, the Lutze um, couloir leading up to the summit. Um, and when we're descending from this mountain, uh, it's getting dark and it's getting windy, really, really strong winds. And as you saw in the picture before, I had dark uh, mm. ski goggles. And when it's dark, uh, you know, you can't use them. You should have clear glass, but I didn't. So I had to take them off. So I couldn't really see down. Uh, and the wind was really, really strong. And we were tired of being climbing for 18 hours. And as you climb on, on these Himalayan mountains, you uh, have a rope in between, and I fix myself into the, to the ice with an ice screw, and then I let go and I belay my partner climbing down. And it took for ages trying to belay him. Like 20 minutes later, 30 meters further down, I get three big pulls in the rope, and that's okay. So it's undo the screw in the ice, and I start climbing down. And it took a really long time. And as we were climbing past each other and repelling and belaying each other, you know, at a snail's pace, we both started to feel that we're getting really cold hands and feet. And at one stage, when we passed each other, I stopped and said, this doesn't work. We would probably both get frostbitten fingers and toes. So we've got two choices now. Either we continue like this, and then we'll probably lose a few fingers and toes, or we, we skip the rope. If we skip the rope, if somebody falls, we fall 2,000 meters straight down to the glacier. So it's easy to sit down here and think about, you know, how should we, what decisions do we make up on a high altitude? But it's a completely different story uh, up on um, when you're there in the situation. Uh, preparing for um, an expedition like this is, of course, essential. You have to be physically and mentally fit. Uh, somebody said, if you fail to prepare, you prepare your failure. Uh, I couldn't agree more. You have to have the right equipment. You have to trust the equipment. Uh, repelling down in Harwood's Hole in New Zealand, it's a almost 200 meter straight vertical. Uh, it's an entrance to a cave with a single rope all the way from the top down to the bottom. And 200 meters might not seem that much if you're walking on the street. But I tell you, if you're hanging in the top of 200 meters and you've got 200 meters down there in a rope that is this thick, you have to trust the equipment. And you have a braking device that the rope goes, goes through. And if you repel too fast, this metal piece will start getting orange. And that's a very bad sign. 
And if you then stop, uh, the rope starts to melt. So you have to have exactly the right pace going down. So equipment is important. And the right amount of equipment, of course, is, 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 is as important. When we were paddling, stand up paddleboard from, from Gotland to, to Stockholm, um, and there's no real space to bring your, your dog or to bring your favorite books or your rock collection. I mean, we do, we, we you know, take away everything that's not necessary. You know these washing labels in, in your clothes? Do we need to know that it's 30 degrees hand wash out in the middle of the Baltic Sea? No. And that weighs a little bit. And breaking the handles of the toothbrush. Actually, that was before. Now we just bring floor tablets and leave the toothbrush at home. And if you're climbing a mountain up and down many times, as you do acclimatizing, all these little things that weigh, if you put them in a pile, it'll be quite a few kilos in the end. And how can I be 100% mental focused on the mission if I know I'm carrying a lot of rubbish? We collected um, in small nets behind the, the, the stand-up paddle boards on part of the ways we um, collected samples of microplastics. And unfortunately, there's quite a lot of microplastics in the Baltic Sea. Um, the longest distance was between two islands. It took 16 hours uh, uh, without break. Uh, and I had just had to take a picture of myself when I um, came to that island. I did a few other rowing projects, like uh, rowing across the, the, the Baltic Sea to Finland. Um, I would get, got tired of sitting in the, in the rowing machine in the gym. And how fun is that? I mean, on a scale from 1 to 10, the rowing machine in the gym about Minus 42, isn't it? Uh, a lot better to, to be out rowing in the, in the, in the um, real, um, on the water. But I didn't have a clue if I was going to make it all the way to Finland. I'd never rowed that far before, but I tried. I tried, I started off. And I think we need to be more open to failure. I mean, failure to me is not not coming up on the summit, not ascending, climbing a mountain. Failure for me is not coming back down from the mountain. So if we don't make it all the way, well, I tried, and I think we need to try more. Now, uh, 75,000 strokes with the oars, and two weeks uh, later, I arrived in the land of the Moomin, which was quite nice. Uh, I'm going to make you the expedition leader of uh, uh, an Everest expedition. And you are now the expedition leader, and you're going to hire the people around you that are going to climb the mountain. So what people do you hire? Climbers. Yeah, OK, OK. <laughs> of course, you hire climbers. But let's dig a bit deeper than that. You are still the expedition leader, and you're going to hire people for an expedition to Everest. What are the most important qualities? What are the most important personal qualities in the people that you would hire to climb on to the highest mountain in the world. Well, I've done uh, some very unscientific research, and I've looked through a lot of the groups that I've been involved in uh, throughout the years, and, and I'm getting pretty old. Uh, and I've come up with this. You need a person If you check um, Wiktionary, uh, wacko, that means uh, somebody that is amusingly irrational and um, uh, eccentric. Amusingly irrational and eccentric. Did you say Donald Trump? No. <laughs> Donald Duck? No. Uh, so uh, this has got nothing to do with the people that you want. You don't want somebody that's wacko. But the first, this just happened to be these uh, words. But this is, to, according to me, the most important personal quality. And what does the W stand for? If you look at the guy standing fourth from the left in the small, tiny guy in the green shirt, his name is Appa Sherpa. And for a high altitude climbing Sherpa, it's important to have been on the summit because then you're easier to get job and you get more paid. Appa Sherpa hadn't been on the summit until our expedition 1990. I was back in 2011. I met Appa Sherpa again, 21 years later. And he looked the same, uh, didn't change at all. And I asked Appa Sherpa, how's it going? Have you been climbing a lot? Yes, every year. Every year, since 1990. Yes, to the summit. Yes, that's 21 years. Yes, that's 21 times to the summit. Yes. So Appa Sherpa, actually together with one other Sherpa, he's been 
this, has the world record of climbing Mount Everest 21 times. And to me, I think that's a good symbol of the most important quality is that you have the will, that you want to do it. And also, it could be nice to know why, when the wand gets weak, to know what button to press. On the um, second word here, the, or letter, the A here, uh, I'm going to take uh, an example of a <clears throat> person. We did a TV series uh, called Beyond Boundaries, uh, Against All Odds, a uh, TV show where we had 10 disabled people, wonderful bunch of crazy, happy, shiny people that were going from the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua to the Pacific coast, 28 days. And this was no game. This was not, you know, not a, a chartered trip. This was for real. And it was the most lovely, I mean, we had our ups and downs. We had our fights, but we have a lot of nice memories from that trip. A little advice, if you're going into the jungle, don't bring two wheelchairs. Uh, if you see the guy sitting in the middle, uh, he's called Pax. He's got cer cerebral uh, palsy, CP, uh, from, the, from birth. And his hands, he couldn't really use his hands. Uh, the most l wonderful, lovely, intelligent, one of the funniest guys I've ever met. And he was really, really strong, but his hands, he couldn't really use his hands. So one time we were climbing this volcano, and it was a storm. We had been walking for 10 hours. Everything was a misery. It started raining. Pax was standing there freezing in soaking wet clothes, shivering, and really, really cold. So I told him, put on some dry clothes in your tent, and, you know, I'll get some warm food. So uh, Pax started, you know, with his hands that he couldn't use, try to get his wet shirt off and, you know. So I came back 20 minutes later and I asked, you know, shouted outside, Pax, how are you going? Are you okay? And, uh, you know, no answer. So, Pax, are you okay? It was storming, the, you know, it was really a misery. And I opened the tent and he was sitting there in, the water was flooding inside the tent with mud and water and he was still shivering and it was, it was terrible. And it was a thunderstorm, and he was sitting there, and, you know, and, and he turned around to me as I opened the tent. And like he was sitting in a straitjacket trying to get this shirt still off after 20 minutes, he turned to me and looked at me with a smile from ear to ear and said, Oscar, I think we're in deep shit. <laughs> I was myself pretty irritated at that time, but he chose to be, uh, have the right attitude, which is the second most important personal quality when you are to work in a group, according to my very unscientific uh, research. Now, the third uh, letter, the C, is of course uh, cooperation. And when sailing across the Atlantic, um, it's still my record actually, 85 knots of breeze is our <laughs> maximum wind speed. Uh, and that's not storm, that's hurricane force winds. Of course you need to be able to cooperate. Uh, it's a big subject. There is one thing about working together, about teamwork, that I think is really important, and that is trust. Do you trust the people in your team? Uh, as a skydiving pilot, uh, you learn how to pack your parachute. And it's an awful lot of parachute to pack. It's like 200 and something square feet of parachute. And a lot of lines that are supposed to be in very correct order. And as a student, you have to call somebody who knows how to pack shoots and ask them, is this okay? Yeah, it looks okay. Okay, but are you sure? Yeah, 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 it looks okay. And you, you know, sort of pack this. And can somebody else come and, you know, you check different stages of packing the shoot. And there's another option, and that is to go to the people working in the, in the, um, in the airfield and pay them $10 to pack your parachute. So you just take this big, huge parachute, and, and give them and say, can you please pack this? Yeah, 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 it'll be five minutes, 10 bucks. No, 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 five minutes. You know, take your time. It's, a, it's let's say, one hour. <laughs> uh, and to me, it's, I think it's a good metaphor of, of trust. Now, who would you ask to pack your parachute that you're going to jump off a plane from in your class, at your work, in your family? The fourth letter in my very unscientific research is the K. And of course, we're in a school, knowledge is really important. Don't go diving under the ice unless you know what you're doing. But if we're going to climb this mountain, you can be, I mean, if you don't have the, 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 the want, if you don't want to climb Everest, if you don't have the right attitude, if you cannot cooperate, 
You can be a professor of everything in the world, but I don't want to be in your team. Yes, it's important, but it's not the most important thing. And then, of course, since this is unscientific, uh, the O stands for a lot of other things that I have forgotten. <laughs> uh, now, the, the, this, the challenge for me as a leader, uh, having a group that is very different, is, is, of course, picking out, making people grow and try to use the different... I mean, an advantage that we actually are different in the group. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's fun because, uh, we, as I said, we had, all have our ups and downs. It's just some, some days we're strong, some days we're weak. Uh, and we need to use this and make people grow. And, and of course, funny situations occur uh, sometimes when we were sailing across the lake of Nicaragua. Um, I asked, you know, if, who can steer a boat? And it was one hand in the air. And, uh, okay, anyone else? Um, okay. Uh, Joachim, you steer the boat. Uh, you're completely blind, but that's okay. It'll probably work out anyway. <laughs> now, I didn't think that blind people could steer boats because they don't see anything, but he heard the waves and he felt the wind in his face. And he had this little compass watch that, you know, okay, it wasn't dead straight. It was a little bit like this, but we came where we wanted to, and I think it's all right. Now, when I talk to children, I never get the, answer, the, the question, why did you climb Mount Everest? Or why did you take your longboard from Stockholm to Gothenburg? For kids, adventures is obvious. They ask, how far could you see standing on the summit of Everest? You know, how many uh, birds, what, uh, what uh, wildlife did you see? And whatever. But they don't question why you climb Everest. Adults do, yes. And why I climbed Everest in those days was a lot of attention recognitions. Look at me. That driving force was strong. Uh, today it's more about, you know, the amplitudes of life that are, you know, a, a rainy Tuesday. It's not much happening. It's not much up or down. To me, doing adventure is about stretching the amplitudes of life and living a little bit more. When it's hard, it's really hard. It's a storm on the ocean. Or you're standing paddling somewhere, God knows where. And it's really down here. It's hard work, but then you get the reward up here. You get religious waking up on a, in a tent, 3.30 in the morning with the, with the sun shining in through the tent. You have some birds singing. So for me, adventure is, you know, living a little bit more. And we chose on Lotse to actually to skip the rope and to climb down each other one by one. And eventually we, we ended up uh, in our camp, eventually down to base camp and uh, had a great expedition. Uh, unfortunately, now my climbing partner is not alive anymore. He committed suicide many years ago. The year before this expedition, another person died on the mountain. Two years after this expedition, uh, two climbing friends, Rob Hall and, and Scott Fisher, died on Everest. And people die. People die skydiving, and friends die, die dying. And that's part of life. Uh, I wake up every morning, almost every, well, I wake up every morning, but I ask myself almost every morning a question, and that is if I'm happy with the life I've lived so far. And almost every day, the answer is yes. I could actually die today and be happy, content with the life that I have lived. So, lesson learned from people dying, and people die from cancer and all different sort of disease. Lesson learned is to live a little bit more. Let's go out, jump out airplanes. I just make sure you trust the one who packed your chute. Let's be wild and crazy. Let's not work too much. Let's play hard. Let's have fun. Let's go climb a mountain. Go outside your comfort zone and live life. And remember, if you end up deep in shit, don't remember to don't forget to smile. Thank you.